Thank you for joining us for this week's message at Crosswind Church. If you have any questions about this message or about Crosswind Church, please visit us at www.crosswindchurch.net or you can email us at info at crosswindchurch.net. Good morning, my name is Jeremy and I'm the pastor here. I am so, so thankful that you have joined us for worship. It is full Christmas season and we're in the swing. Graduates uh, that just graduated from UT Martin, like congratulations. To all of you guys, I know we have so many folks that are out traveling today, um, and they're watching online, so I want to say thank you and, and welcome to all of you guys that are watching online um, as well. Uh, here at Crossman Church, we do something that's really, really cool with our staff, and you may be aware of it, you may not be aware of it, but when we sat down to write policies for um, how we handle our full-time ministerial staff in particular, um, we said that one of the things we wanted to do uh, was to build in some breaks, some Sabbaths, if you will, to use a biblical term. And so every three years, um, our full-time pastoral staff uh, get a 30-day sabbatical. It's, it's just kind of one of those opportunities where we can go spend that time for studying, uh, reflecting, uh, relaxing, uh, that sort of thing. And so uh, this last year, I was actually year four, um, I did take my sabbatical in year three because I'm hard-headed. And um, the elders came to me and they said, you have to go do it. So this summer, I went to go take my sabbatical. And during one of those weeks, I got to do something really, really neat. And, and uh, if you want to check into it and ask me more about it a little bit later, um, I'll tell you. But we got to go to a place, or I got to go to a place um, called Onsite. And Onsite, you may remember when we talked uh, during the series called The Hunt, Carlos Whitaker's uh, book, To Kill the Spider, um, was written about his time at Onsite. So I read a little bit about Onsite, and, and uh, Onsite, basically the way Carlos described it in his book, is sleepaway camp for adults. That's, that's the way he described it. Um, and there's some time where we get to spend some one-on-one, -on -one, like some alone time. Um, there's time where we're spending it with, with one other person, one-on-one. -on -one, where we're spending most of our time in small groups uh, with a licensed therapist um, that just kind of helps us kind of do deal with whatever it is that you're kind of dealing with. So there were folks there that had um, some, some really things that we would say would be like large issues. And then there's some folks that were just kind of trying, I was just trying to recenter kind of my life and refocus and that sort of thing. And I got to go to onsite. And I was a little bit concerned and a little bit nervous, just, just to be honest with you, because um, this idea of like being vulnerable and opening up, like it's easy for me to do with you guys and tell stories about how you know, I mess up and that sort of stuff because you don't get to talk back to me because um, I have the microphone. But when you sit in a small room and people have opportunity to speak in your life, it was really a little bit nervous, nerve, like nerve-wracking for me. And so I can remember you pull up in, in Cumberland Furnace, Tennessee, the on-site you know, campus, and there's a big mansion, the Juilliard Mansion, and then behind it is this carriage house where most of our activities kind of were, were in. And you walk into this big room. Um, where, where you would have big group sessions every morning where they would lecture on certain um, issues and topics and that sort of thing. Very interesting. And, uh, and right above the door, uh, leading out of that room into the rest of the carriage house where the, the kitchen was and the small group rooms and the bathroom and all that, um, there was a sign. And, and that sign had a phrase. And that phrase was this. It was, trust the process, celebrate the miracles. Trust the process, Celebrate the miracles. Let me tell you why this is such a big deal um, at Onsite and then how it's going to apply to us. It's a big deal for Onsite because some of the things that they ask you to do when you get there, some of the situations that circum they, they kind of circumstances they put you in are designed to stretch you just a little bit. They're designed to take you kind of out of your comfort zone and put you in a place where, where you kind of have to engage in vulnerability, engage with other people. And, and, and because that can make you a little bit uncomfortable, they constantly tell you, if you go to their website, this is all over the place, they say, trust the process. Because if you don't trust the process, then at the end of the, the experience, you won't necessarily have the outcome that you wanted to have um, while you were there. So trust the process and celebrate the miracles. Now, this is a mantra that is not just unique to on-site. It's one of those things that, that other people have kind of uh, latched onto. This idea of trusting the process. It's a big thing in the sports world. So you may um, have heard the most famous example of this uh, is in 2013, the Phoenix Suns I'm sorry, <clears throat> yes, in 2013, the Philadelphia 76ers um, were having uh, some, some change in leadership. They hired a new general manager, and uh, they brought him in, and he said to the organization and to the fans of this NBA basketball team, he said, listen, we're going to restructure the way that we're going to rebuild the team. We're going to do some things differently. And what that may mean is that along the way, we may lose some games. What it may mean along the way is it may look like it doesn't make sense. But all you have to do is trust, process. Sure enough, the Sixers became really, really bad. 
In fact, a couple years ago, uh, they won 10 games, lost 72 games. That, to me, constitutes a really terrible season, right? But, but last year, just last year, they actually, um, in the last season, they actually went to the playoffs. They won the first round of the playoffs and went to the second round of the playoffs. So they're moving in the right direction. So the general manager might be able to go, look, because you were willing to trust the process, now we're able to see the results. Now we're willing to see and be able to see those miracles that are kind of coming along the way. But I wondered about that, and I wondered, well, it's easy for us to trust the process when we get to see the results. It's easy, it's easy when, when the miracle kind of happens at the end and you walk out on site and your life has been changed for the better or when the NBA team kind of makes the turnaround or, or your sports team kind of, kind, of, kind, of, kind, of, kind of starts moving in the right direction. It's easy for us to go, yeah, I'm going to trust the process. Yeah, I, I, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of bought in. But what happens when you don't see that? What happens when the team doesn't turn around? What happens when you don't experience <coughs> the miracle? What happens when you walk into church during Christmas? And the pastor says, we're going to start a brand new sermon series today based on, on this passage in Matthew chapter 1. This passage that we've been reading the entire time. This, this passage has kind of been the mantra for our series with us. That passage in, in Matthew chapter 1, um, beginning in verse 22, where it says, All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means, say it with me, what does it mean? God with us. See, it's easy for us to trust that God is with us. It's easy for us to trust the process that God is with us. When we see that there's a result at the end, when we see that, that we're moving in the direction that we're supposed to be headed. But what happens when we ask God for the miracle, when we put our trust in God and we don't get what we want? What happens when we have to pray for years and years and years and years and, and we never see God come through for us? I always think of my grandmother when I think about, about this passage, about, about what it means to trust God and trust the process. My grandmother grew up, uh, or excuse me, my grandmother uh, married my grandfather and was married to him for an incredibly long time until he passed away um, just a few years ago. And, uh, and during that entire time, my grandpa uh, dealt with alcoholism. He, he was very verbally abusive at, at different times during his life when my mom and her sisters were really little. Um, and, and he really kind of struggled with that. And so my grandmother was so faithful to pray for him and pray for him and pray for him and pray that God would grab a hold of his life and that he would turn his life over to Jesus and that he would have a change of heart. And for decades, I'm not talking years, for decades, she prayed for him and didn't see any result. And I just thinking, like, how easy would it have been for us to give up? And God, God isn't with me. God isn't going to come through. This is not something God can do. And I trusted the process, and the process didn't, didn't work. But she didn't give up. She didn't give up. And in his mid-50s, my grandpa gave his life to Jesus Christ, and I got to baptize him. That is pretty cool, right? You see, you see, it's easy for us to trust in the process when we see the miracles, but what happens when you pray for a miracle? When you pray for God to heal somebody, and He doesn't do it? Or He doesn't do it in the time frame that you feel like He should do it in? What happens when you pray for your marriage and yet God isn't able to come through or God doesn't come through or doesn't seem like He's able to come through? What, what about that then? How do you trust in the process? Today, we're going to get some answers to these questions. Some really practical answers as to why it is that God's time frame is not like our time frame. And why it is that God seems to, to not come through in certain areas and comes through in some other areas. And to get some answers to these questions, we're going to kind of look at a letter that was written by a guy named Peter. Now, Peter was one of Jesus' 12 disciples. He was actually one of the inner circle of three. I love Peter because I can kind of relate to Peter quite a bit. There's times when Peter is on fire for Jesus and he's ready to go to, to, to his own uh, death for Jesus. And there's other times where he stands in front of a middle school girl and he denies that he even knows Jesus. Like, that, this, this, there's this entire like, this dichotomy that is Peter. Like, the Peter that gets out of the boat and walks on the water. And then the Peter that looks at the waves and sinks into the water. Like, that's who Peter kind of was. I love him. I so, I so relate to Peter. And Peter uh, became the leader and one, or one of the leaders in the church in Jerusalem and then later would travel around and spread the gospel all over. And he wrote a letter to a group of Christians that we're going to read today. A group of Christians that were experiencing some persecution. A group of Christians that were having some doubts and some pushback. And he writes to them some things that I think are going to be incredibly, incredibly helpful to us today. So let's take a look at the second 
letter that Peter wrote. Peter, uh, Second Peter, and we're going to start in chapter 3. And we're going to work our way through this. It's a really tough passage of Scripture, so stick with me as we work our way through it. Now, chapter 3, verse 3, this is what Peter says. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has been since the beginning of creation. Now, I need to kind of give you some context. It says that in the last days, scoffers will come. One of the things that we just realized in the 21st century, and even Peter's uh, uh, disciples and disciples of Jesus in the first century understood, is that they are living in the last days. Every generation that has been alive since Jesus was on this earth has had the belief that they were living in the last days, that Jesus could return at any time. But Peter is writing this 30 years or so after Jesus rose from the dead and promised that he was going to come back. We now live a couple thousand years after Jesus rose from the dead and, and said that he was going to come back. And what Peter says that scoffers are going to do, people are going to come and they're going to ask, where is this God? Where is Jesus that said he was going to be with us, that said he was going to return? Where is this, this God that has it so wrapped up in his nature to reconcile us? Why hasn't he come? Today is just like yesterday, and tomorrow is going to be just like today. And they began to believe, they began to believe that Jesus wasn't going to come at all. They had given up on the process. They had given up on God. They were no longer willing to trust in a God that said that He was with them when it certainly didn't seem like He was with them. <clears throat> Maybe you struggle with this, right? Maybe you struggle by looking around the world and you see all the things that are going on. You look at your own life and you see all the struggles that you're experiencing. You know, tomorrow's going to be just like today. Today was just like the day before. Where is God? You're not the only person who's dealt with that. In the late 1960s, a guy by the name of Steve Jobs, you may have heard of him. He, uh, in his biography um, that was written a few years ago, um, it came out, uh, they described this story that Steve had when he was about 14 years old. It said that he grew up in a small Lutheran church and he walked into church one day, not armed with his Bible, but armed with a Life magazine. A Life magazine that, that came out in the summer of 1968. And he went up to the pastor of this church and he said to the pastor, Pastor, does God know everything? And the pastor said, yes. Steve, of course, God knows everything. He says, if I were to lift up one finger on my hand, God would know which finger I'm going to lift up. The pastor said, yes, Steve, God knows everything. And then Steve pulled out the Life magazine from 1968 and it had this picture on the cover of it. And he said, does God know about this? And the pastor said, Steve, I know that you don't understand. But yes, God knows even that. Steve was infuriated by the answer that was so simplistic and wasn't able to answer his concerns about how a good and loving God allows millions of people to starve to death during the Civil War in Nigeria in the 1960s and 1970s. And he walked out of church that day and he vowed never to worship that God again. And he didn't. And in fact, you probably, have, if you haven't been in that situation, you know of somebody that's been in that situation. Where you look at your own life and you say, look, we prayed for and it didn't happen. We asked God to do and it didn't happen. Right? Why would somebody that's so godly have to battle that cancer? Why would someone that loves Jesus have to battle that disease? Why would God take that person and not this person? Why does God cause... This, the unrighteous people and the wicked people of the world to prosper while, while some of the most righteous people in the world just don't prosper. Why in the world does that happen? You look all over the world and you see people that don't have access to clean water and children that are dying because they don't have enough food to eat or they don't have access to the modern medicine that can save them from diseases that are totally preventable. And you look at the world that's full of all kinds of evil and you ask the questions, don't you? Well, if God knows that, then why does He do something? Maybe he isn't there at all. If he is there, maybe he isn't good. But I'll tell you one thing. I'm not going to trust in that guy. In fact, some of you are here today because you're trying it out, maybe again for the first time, or there's a cute girl here, or whatever it was, the reason you showed up, I, it doesn't really matter. And, 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 and you, 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 you've been pushing back from church. And you've been pushing back from God because you couldn't figure out 
why God allows bad things in this world. If He's so good, and if He's with us, and you've given up on the process, or you're thinking about giving up on the process. Peter says, listen, that's going to happen. People are always going to say that. People are always going to push back away from God. Here's, here's what they have forgotten. Look at the next verse, verse 5. It says, but they deliberately forget. <clears throat> they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being. And the earth was transformed out of water and by water. And these waters also, the world of that time, was deluged and destroyed. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept to the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. That, that's really confusing. Let me tell you what it is that he's saying here. Peter's going, what they forget is that yesterday has not always been like today. That things have not always been this way. There's a time, Peter would say, that they forget about when, when, when there was nothing but God. And with the word, God spoke into existence all that there is. And there's a time where wickedness was so rampant on the earth that God said, we're going to start over with Noah. And we're going to make a covenant with Noah and his descendants. And God caused a flood to come across the earth. They forget that God saw the depravity of mankind and sent his son to die on their behalf to reconcile us, a wicked, fallen world, to our Heavenly Father. They forget that there was a time when God raised the dead back to life. And they forget, they forget that there's coming a time, there's coming a time when this present earth and this present heaven will pass away and God will create a new heaven and a new earth where every wrong is righted and every tear is wiped away and there is no more death. There is no more disease. They have forgotten that it hasn't always been this way and that it won't always be this way. They've lost their focus. And they've forgotten what exactly it is that God has done. So, so here's the question. Here's the question that we all ask. Come on. If God one day is going to right every wrong, if God one day is going to bring judgment on the ungodly, then, then why doesn't He just do it now? Then why doesn't He just, why is He waiting why are we continuing to suffer? Why are we continuing to experience all of these traumatic experiences? Why are we continuing to watch loved ones battle with disease and death? Why are we continuing to deal with the sinfulness of the world? If God's going to do something, then why in the world doesn't He do it? I'm so glad you asked because Peter is getting ready to give us two reasons. Look at the next verse. Verse 8, he says this, But do not forget this thing, one thing, dear friends, that with the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like... This is kind of cool. You see, throughout human history, individuals, human beings, have ascribed the same, um, the same limitations to their God or gods that they have. So on some level, they think that God, the God or gods that they worship throughout history, are, are bound by the same laws. And, and the same um, uh, kind of boundaries that we have. I'll, I'll give you kind of an example. So um, you all understand that we um, live, exist in time. And that you and I, if time or an era, we're walking forward on that era. And we cannot deviate from that. You realize that? Like we're in this dimension of time and that's where we're stuck. We can't pause in this dimension of time. Can't do that. We can't go back in this dimension of time. At least not yet. Right? We can't do that. And we can't move to the left or to the right of this dimension of time. We can't move above it. We can't move below it. We are essentially stuck, not even in a total one dimension of time, in a half dimension of time moving forward. You tracking with me? With me? All right. Now, what we as humans do is we kind of assume that God is also in that same, in that same uh, dimension. That God is also working in that same time frame. When we look at the Greek and Roman gods, the gods that were being worshipped at the time Peter wrote this, they actually believe that their gods function very much in the same way that we as humans function. And we can argue on whether or not they believe their gods could die, but they certainly believe that their gods could come to an end. Does that make sense? Their gods could be cast into the underworld, and although there may be a way out, there certainly might be an end to their physical existence, at least for a time being. So they, they would believe that their gods were wrapped up in the same way. But what if it's not like that? Wait, let me see if I can explain it this way. Back in 1884... There was a, uh, there was a, a schoolmaster and theologian, and I wrote his name down, so what did you get? His name was Edwin Abbott. And Edwin Abbott, um, Edwin Abbott uh, 
uh, wrote a book called Flatland. It is mathematical fiction. Okay, it is it is it is kind of difficult to get through. Um, I read a little bit of it this last week, and in Edwin uh, Abbott's book Flatland, what he described was a world that existed only in two dimensions. Right? Meaning everything is flat. Meaning that, that, that there's no third dimension. You and I are three-dimensional human beings. You understand? We have width and, and depth and height. Okay? And as a result, we see shapes and those sorts of things. But Edward Abbott said, what would it look like if, if the entire world were flat, much like this board? And so we take a, a, an individual and we put him on this board. There he is. Sam, we should name him. We'll call him Stanley because I've heard of Flat Stanley. This is Flat Stanley, and there he is on our board. Now, what's interesting is us as 3D observers, we see that, that Flat Stanley has a, a face, he has a head. Now he's got a face. He has a face and a head, and he has a body, he has arms, he has legs, he's rudimentary, as my stick figure is. We understand that he has this shape to him. But if we were to put ourselves in black I mean, if we were to kind of get all the way down level and look at flat scaling in this way, we wouldn't see a circle head. What we would see is a line. In fact, what we might see would be something that looks a little bit like that. So the question is, how would Flat Stanley view all of his friends? All of his friends would look exactly the same because they would just be lines. Now, some of the lines would be shorter than others, and as they got farther away from him, certainly the line would get smaller, and as they got closer to him, the line would get bigger. But that is all he would be able to see. That's all he would be able to comprehend. Now, let me ask you a question. What if me, a three-dimensional creature, were to insert, say, let's just say, for instance, my hand into... The two-dimensional plane. Right? Is Flat Stanley going to be able to see my hand? Of course he's not going to be able to see it. You know what he's going to see? He's going to see five lines that don't even seem to be connected to each other. And he might have a hunch, he might have a feeling that maybe there's something more, maybe they are connected to one another, but in fact he wouldn't be able to perceive that just in two-dimensional kind of structure. That's it. You, you with me? You with me? So as a result, he would have no idea what I, a three-dimensional creature, was doing inside of his two dimensions. This is what Edwin Abbott proposed in his book, Flat Lane. Now, here's the thing I want you to kind of wrap your head around. What Peter says in very finite human language is this. With God, a thousand years is like a day. A day is like a thousand years. What that means is that God's concept of time is so different than ours that it's incredibly difficult for us to get that what if a God is not necessarily bound by the same limits of time that we're bound by? What if He's not bound by the same half dimension that we're bound by? Humans have always just kind of understood that this is what God was, this is what God did. He was bound by the same limitations we were bound by. What if He's not? What if He's above time? What if He's beyond time? What if, what if time to Him is, is a completely different kind of perspective so that for him a thousand years is like a day a day is like a thousand years it, 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 our uh, timelines are not his timelines is what Peter is kind of getting at see the idea that we would be so audacious as to think that God must adhere to our timeline that, that's, that's, that's ludicrous that makes him not God and that makes us God Peter's going listen I know it seems like a long time in 30 years, 2,000 years, your lifetime of experience and trouble, like, like, I get it. But you have to understand. <coughs> God doesn't think about time the same way you think about time. So the question is to remain. Why doesn't He do something? I understand that God has this different perspective of time, but why? Why is He waiting? The next verse gives us the answer. It's one of my favorites. In all of Scripture. Verse 9 says this, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise. As some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will disappear with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with fire, and the earth, and everything done, and it will be laid bare. Th this is so cool. Stick with me. He says, listen, God is not patient of God, is not, God is not slow to act, excuse me, as you would think slowness. The reason that God is tarrying is because He's patient with you. Because God loves you. God wants everyone to be able to come to repentance. 
God wants everyone to come into a relationship with Him. And so His patience is just a reflection of His love. The reason why God isn't acting is because He is waiting for many to come to faith in Him. Maybe He's even waiting for you. Maybe He's waiting for your neighbor. Maybe He's being patient with them, giving them every opportunity to give their lives to Him. God's patience is not a sign of His displeasure. His patience is a reflection of His love for His love for me. His love for me. It may be, it may be that the very thing you're going through is the thing that God wants to use to draw other people closer to Him. It may be that He recognizes that we have a world that's floundering and that is lost and that's looking to be fulfilled in so many ways. We have a world, world that is numbing themselves and self-medicating themselves and, and, and escaping all over the place, trying to find all kinds of things and pleasures to fill the void that is in their life when He knows that the thing they need is there. And it may be the way that you handle your circumstances, the way that you handle your situations, it may be that that is the very thing that draws some of them into a relationship with Him. When I was about 12 years old, I had the opportunity to go to the uh, National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. You guys know, uh, you may know, uh, I have a blood disease called chronic granulomatous disease. It causes my body to not fight bacteria and fungus very well. And so I, I've been sick uh, for good portions of my life and battled all kinds of infections that, that probably should have killed me. Um, um, but uh, but in the, in, when I was about 12 years old, the National Institutes of Health said, we're doing some studies to try to help people with your disease. And uh, we want you to come and kind of be a guinea pig. You're going to try different medicines and see how it works on you. Um, and when I was a senior in high school, I can remember I went to participate in a study um, where they caused, they gave me a medicine that caused my bones to release white blood cells um, from, my, from my, my bone marrow. And, um, and then they took those white blood cells and they began to work on them to try to fix them. Because my white blood cells don't work, so they wanted to try to fix them. The goal would be that if they could do that well enough, that in other patients later on down the road when they perfected the technique, they could take their white blood cells, fix them, and put them back in them and heal them from the disease. You want to know something that I knew at the age of 12, or sorry, at the age of 18 when I was in college? Woo! Senior in high school. What I knew was that I would likely never benefit from the research that was being done on my white blood cells. I knew that it would be decades probably before the research would, would come to fruition and they would have any kind of breakthrough that could be tried in, in human studies. I, I knew enough of that to know that, that likely at that point I would be too old if I was still alive for them to be able to do that research on me. But I understood that if I went through this trial right now, if I went through this struggle right now, it was incredibly painful to have that medicine given to me so my bone marrow would release these white blood cells. And if I were willing to go through it, and maybe somebody else might be helped down the road. I can remember thinking that, 17, 18 years old. As a senior in high school. It could be that the struggle you're going through, the trial you're going through, the circumstances you have that are less than ideal, it may be that the reason you're going through them is because God wants someone who's lost to see you go through them with faith. He wants somebody that's far from Him to see how you can have hope and joy in the midst of terrible circumstances. It may be the very thing that you're frustrated with, the very thing that causes you to push back from God and not trust Him, that very thing may be the very thing he uses to draw people into a relationship with Him. Now, if that's true, if that's true, then how should we live? If that's true, then, then how should that change our lives? Peter tells us, chapter 3, verse 11, he says this, Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. But real quickly, this idea of living a holy life means living a life that's set apart. Living a life that's different. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, He would make this statement. He said, if you want to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, then you need to love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you. You need to not act like everybody else, right? You need to engage with those that are far from Him, love them, pray for them, encourage them, you know, you need to see somehow figure out how to be the balance, not the balance of it, the fullness of grace and the fullness of truth. You need to learn how to live a life that's set apart and different from the world. 
He says not only that, you need to live a godly life. This little word godly, I absolutely love. In the Greek, it's a compound word of two words that go together. It literally means good worship. You're living a life of good worship. Paul in Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 1, would say that, that you are to offer your body as a living sacrifice. It's holy and pleasing to God. That, he says, is your spiritual act of worship. The idea is that on a daily basis, I'm going to learn how to live as Jesus would have lived. I'm going to live out my life that's filled with, 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 with joy rather than despair. I'm going to live a life that's filled with hope rather than despair. I'm going to live a life that's directing other people towards Jesus Christ, the person in whom I have found salvation, and He is being patient with. So that they might be able to find salvation. Wow, that is such a big deal. You're supposed to live a holy and a godly life. And then the last part is this. You're supposed to look forward. Look forward to the day that is coming. Setting your focus on the day that is coming. You want to know what's true about me? Um, I tend to find the things that I'm looking for. Aside from my keys. I tend, to, I, tend to, I tend to see the things that I'm looking for, right? So a couple weeks ago, my wife and I were in Walmart. And Walmart's one of those places that I, I love to hate, right? Like, um, where else can I buy peanut butter and a fire extinguisher in the same place? I love that. But there's like so many people there. And, and when people go to Walmart, they forget how to walk. And they forget that the, that the aisles are so narrow and they put their buggies in the way. And I just want to go in and get stuff and get out. I'm really not a, anyway. I have problems. And so my wife and I went to Walmart, and, and, and I just I started kind of doing what I normally do, I'm kind of grumbling. Maybe, maybe, maybe some of you guys do that when you go to Walmart or other places. Just kind of walk in. Oh, you know, lots of people are here. You know, I can't believe the price of dog food in Kenya. And I was just going on and on and on. In fact, that particular day, I was complaining about how much money we were spending on dog food. You realize, like... Good night. Anyway, and so I was just going on and on and on and on and on and on, and on about that. And my wife just kind of called me out. Jenny called me out. And she was like, listen, you are so negative. You need to stop saying negative things. And I was like, I'm not negative. You're so negative. And so I said, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, try, to, I'm just going to try to see how many negative things I say. And so I would make a comment. I'd look over and go, is that negative? And she would go, yes. Hey, I'd say something else. Is that negative? Yes. Here's the thing that I noticed. When you go into Walmart and you look for the negatives, guess what you'll see? The negatives. But if you go into Walmart and you say, listen, I'm going to look for the positives. I'm going to look for where God is at work. Then guess what? You will start to see where God is at work. This is just incredibly true. Psychology calls this confirmation bias. You see what it is that you're looking for. The idea is that if you wake up every day and all you look for is despair, and all you look for is what is wrong, and all you look for is all those areas where it doesn't seem like God is coming through, then you will find those areas, and you will be tempted to not trust God and to push back in the process. But if you wake up every day and you say, you know what, I'm going to look for where God is at work, guess what you'll start to see? You'll start to see where God is at work. What Peter says is, I want you to look forward. To what's coming. I, I know that it may be difficult right now. Some of you are experiencing persecution and, and death and beatings. That's what, the, that's what they were experiencing, right? I just want you to look forward to what is coming. And that's why Paul, with that kind of perspective, would write things like, I mean, the wind is rising, the die is gain. That's why he'd be able to write things like, I believe the present sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed in us in Christ Jesus. It's because he wasn't looking all the negative. He was looking for what God was doing in the world by drawing all people to him. Listen, I know that what you're going through is difficult. I know that your lives are filled with financial strain and marital strain and relationship strain. I, I know, I know that you've had people that have talked about you behind your back. And, and I know that you haven't necessarily gotten everything that you wanted out of the life that you lived. I know that there are even things that you prayed to God for. His timetable is not your timetable. His ways are not your ways. Whatever it is, whatever a good pastor might say, and it's frustrating for you, and it's natural if you want to push back away from that. I'm sorry. God is not slow to act in our world as an act of, of payback for our sin. He's not slow to act 
because he doesn't love you. And he's not slow to act as we would count slowness. But he, in fact, loves you and is patient with us. He is wanting all of us to come to repentance. He's wanting as many as can come into a saving relationship with Him. So, for those of you who are here today, when you're a follower of Jesus Christ, let, let, let me just tell you how important it is. The world is watching you. For those of us that call Jesus Lord, the world is watching how you handle difficult circumstances. They're watching how you handle disease and sickness. They're watching how you handle your marriage and how you parent your kids. They are watching you. And it may be the very circumstances that God has put you in that is going to draw other people into a relationship with Him. So look for where God is at work and join Him in that. And be aware that you have a world that is watching you. Focus on what is to come and you will see God work. He will work in and through you. In short, in short, we say this way. Trust God because the best is yet to come. Amen. Trust God because the best is yet to come. But for those of you that are here today and you're not a follower of Jesus, I want you to know something. You have a God that loves you so much that is patiently waiting for you Turn your life over. And maybe, maybe the reason that you're here today is because He is extending His grace to you. He's going, look, my arms are wide open. And I love you so much. And though, as we said earlier, the night is holding on to you, I am holding on still. Though the troubles are there, I am holding on still because I am with you. And I will always. Just a minute. I'm going to pray a prayer. And there's nothing magical about the words. There's nothing magical about, about what it is we see. It's about the attitude of your heart towards God. If you're here today and you want to know the peace that comes from having a Savior that loves you. If you want to know what, what, what comes what, when you get the joy about what is to come rather than your current circumstances. If you want to know what it's like to have your eternity secure, I just invite you just to pray along with me. You can do it out loud. You can do it in your heart. You can, you can do it in your own words. It doesn't matter. But I wonder if today you would be willing to surrender your life and go, God, my circumstances are not what I want them to be, but I'm going to trust in you because the best is yet to come. Will you pray with me? God, you have provided a way where there was no way. And it's so easy, as we sang earlier, to, to wonder why the, uh, the answers aren't coming to our questions. And why the time frame doesn't match our time. God, I pray that in the middle of our doubt, in the middle of our circumstances, and in the middle of our struggle, you might extend your grace to us today. And I'm so thankful that you're doing that. So God, we admit that we are sinful. It is, it is in our makeup. We know that we are prone to wander away from You and to try to do things as they're right in our own mind rather than as right as You. And so God, because of that, we, we know that we're separate from You and, and that we need to be reconciled to You. And we know that when You sent Jesus to die on the cross, You did so to reconcile our hearts to You. And God, you caused him to rise from the dead after three days, and that has given us the ability to know that we no longer need to fear death. Because the best is yet to come. And so, God, we give our lives totally and completely to you today. We ask that you would transform us from the inside out and make us more like your son, Jesus. And we thank you for the salvation that you've granted us here today. God, I pray now for the individuals that have prayed that prayer for the very first time, that you would give them the strength and the courage to do what's next, to take those next steps and to let other people know about what it is that you've done in their heart and their life. 
God, I love you. And we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, before we go, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time today, I want to invite you to take the next step. In just a minute, I'm going to dismiss us and we'll have people going all over the place. Right back here to my left, you're right. We're the starting point room. And I would love for you to come and tell us about the new relationship that you have with Jesus. Okay? So, let's be dismissed. Thank you so much for coming. I'll see you next week.